Welcome to episode 115 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Mr. Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer and director Jody Wheeler and his producing partner Steve Parker. They recently did a film called The Dark Place. We walked through how that project got off the ground and how they raised money for it, so stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking us on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. A couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 115. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional logline and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Again, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So a quick few words about what I'm working on. Not really a ton of new um, updates, not a ton of new stuff has happened since last week. I'm starting to get into the notes. Um, I got a lot of notes on the pinch and I'm starting to get into those. I'm going to be taking a real stab at the rewrite this week and probably next week. So it'll probably take me maybe two weeks. So that's probably the next couple of weeks worth of my writing time is just polishing up the pinch. Then I will move into a, um, a shot list and start really breaking the script down, um, you know, on more of a practical level, just about shooting it. I've been um, putting out some feelers too, getting some crew together. So I've got a couple of people to interview on that front. So that's coming together nicely. The plan is still to shoot in July. So that gives me, you know, a little bit of time to kind of ramp things up. I mentioned this before, but, um, you know, through the Kickstarter campaign, one of the, 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 the greatest sort of side benefits of running a Kickstarter campaign is just meeting a lot of folks. And I had a lot of folks offer to help out on the film. Um, people that had different various, you know, skills, technical skills, production skills that they were willing to offer up um, to help on the film. So that was greatly appreciated. So it just occurs to me that there's probably a lot of people out here who maybe listen to this podcast. If you have any um, experience working in production, please do. And, and this sounds like an interesting project to work on. Please do just drop me an email. It's info at selling your screen com and um, you know perhaps you can come and work on the pinch um, so as I said I've got a lot of great um, met a lot of great people through the Kickstarter campaign so I'm sure there's other people out there as well so don't hesitate to just drop me um, drop me an email obviously we're gonna shoot here in Los Angeles so if you're not in Los Angeles that um, you know depending on what your skill set is that might not um, work for you but um, just drop me an email and just start a conversation it's info at selling your screenplay.com anyway that's what I'm working on so now let's get into the main segment today I'm interviewing writer director Jody Wheeler and his um, producing partner Steve Parker. Welcome, Jody and Steve, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show and talking with me today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. So let's just start out by maybe you guys can just give us a quick overview of your careers, just kind of, you know, the early days, how you got interested in film, and then those first few credits um, all the way up through um, The Dark Place, and then then we'll drill down specifically into The Dark Place. But just give us a little overview of kind of your careers and how you got um, got into the entertainment industry. Steve, you want to go first? Uh, sure. So uh, I, I did it by uh, being a movie buff and eventually deciding uh, that I wanted to get up out of the seat and uh and and see if i couldn't do it better um i've been attending uh frameline and other uh independent film festivals in my home of san francisco uh for uh more years than i care to count um and spent many years watching as as much as 100 features a year um and uh finally decided i wanted to make them um i actually have uh, a day job at a tech company in Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, so this is actually a sort of a second uh, career of sorts. Okay. And I wonder if we can just um, 
clarify a couple of things. So you said you've been watching these films, going to film festivals. You had this idea, hey, maybe I can do better. And I think that's probably a very common thing. What were some of your first steps to actually make that happen, to actually say, okay, I'm now just watching films and I'm going to go to actually making movies? What were some of the first steps you um, took to actually make that happen? Uh, well, in San Francisco at the time, we were blessed with a uh, f- uh, film co-op uh, called Film Arts Foundation. Uh, and, uh, I went in and took, uh, a class on how to run a 16 millimeter Bolex film camera, how to set up lighting, uh, all that kind of stuff. And they rented out equipment and I, uh, rented out some equipment. I, uh, got a couple of my friends to go stand in front of the camera and shot a music video of one of my favorite artists. Hmm. Okay, perfect, perfect. Jody, maybe you could give us kind of a quick overview um, um, like Steve did. Uh, well, I was a therapist and social worker for a number of years, and but all that time um, I was interested in film, and I wrote for some local television back in Washington, D.C., and then I had the opportunity to come out to Los Angeles. Um, I kind of thought that Steven Spielberg would meet me when I pulled into town, you know, hearing that I was here, and that didn't happen. So I spent um, more time... Uh, in, uh, in the therapy world. But while that was going on, I was writing and I was submitting to, to film festival or festivals and to um, screen, screenplay competitions. I placed in um, Project Greenlight, um, I, let's see, I think it was the last year before they, they rebooted it. Um, I, was a top, I was a top finalist in that. Um, I had won some other awards for some scripts and I was making short films on the side, and, and I was kind of failing at making the short films. Um, I was learning about what works and what doesn't work and how you make a movie and how you write stuff. And then um, about 10 years ago, suddenly everything clicked. I got into UCLA um, in their MFA program, so I left social work, went back, um, went back to school. And while I was there, um, I really intensified my writing and uh, won some more awards. I sold a script out of uh, when I got out of school um, that got actually got produced. Um, I produced a couple of films and uh, wound up uh, making my way and meeting up with Steve and we joined up together and, and have started making films. Okay, okay. And let me um, just touch on, you said you sold that first um, spec script and it actually got made. What was the name of that title? That film was called uh, City on Fire Heat or, or Heat Wave, um, depending upon where in the world the great Z movie was shown. Um, I had been, uh, sending, um, scripts to a contact at, uh, a network called, um, here, uh, TV, uh, region entertainment. And they had a really curious model at the time where, um, they had a, uh, they had one of two, um, U S, uh, LGBT network TV networks, but they also had a, had a, uh, broad audience, um, international releasing thing for, for, grade B films. So uh, I, I kept sending them scripts and scripts and scripts. And finally, they came back to me and hired me to write a movie for them. And um, their model was you had to write a movie with um, some scenes that could be shot for the LGBT market and some scenes that could be shot for the mainstream market. But then it was one movie. So they would cut two versions of this movie, one for gay people or lesbians, um, and then one for everybody else. And they would kind of do a, the double bang for their bucks. So I got hired to write that. It was um, it was like a three week. I had three weeks to write a movie, and uh, then a two weeks to write the movie and a week to polish it. Um, they they all they could guarantee me it wasn't paid very well, but all they can guarantee me was that uh, it would actually be produced. And um, I I did it, turned it in. A year later, I showed up on the set, and um, in that interim time, I think there had been ten rewrites. Um, three credited and seven uncredited, um, none of which made what was already kind of a shaky film because you really can't write a good film in three weeks. I mean, unless you're like the top tier person, um, you just can't do it. But I showed up on set and I had these people coming up to me with with names that I'd never heard of, telling me how much they loved the characters that I was writing that I wrote for them. And I went and I was reading the script and I'm going. It's like being at a party and you're meeting people and you know you've met them somewhere in the past, but you really can't place them. And I'm just reading the script and I'm going, 10 rewrites? They, it's, it's no better. It's worse than what I turned into them. And, and so, yes, so City on. But 
it made me a produced screenwriter, opened the door, so I'm always indebted to the people who took the chance on me for that, and um, it, it, it really helped. So that was my first claim to fame in Hollywood. So just cause, just so I can clarify, so like you would write one script and then in one version they would shoot a scene where the heroine was played by a man and then the other no. scene it was played by Actually, a woman. Actually, it so- was a female lead in this film. And so, um, and so her lab assistant, uh, her female lab assistant was her lesbian lover in the lesbian version and the straight and the, and the male rival was her love interest in the, heter- in the straight version. And I wrote scenes where... They had they had romantic interaction where they had uh, female female interactions and male male interactions and sex and then they shot both of those and then they would cut they would cut two different versions of the movie together. Now in my mind in my mind the real movie is that she loved them both and so there's just this one giant movie where you know she would wrestle with any of them but but that's how they did it and they had two movies that they got out of this and and they they still didn't make a very good movie but there there you go yeah. So fair enough. So um, I always like to, too, to just get some details. How did you actually find, you said, was it region entertainment? How did you actually find this company? Were you just sending out cold query letters to lots of companies? Was it through networking? It was through networking. It was through networking. I met um, a VP of development there. Uh, I was doing some volunteer work at um, Outfest, which is the local, which is the Los Angeles LGBT festival. And then I was managing theaters at Sundance um, every year. And somewhere in all of that, I met um, uh, one of the VPs over there and I just, uh, and I just started sending them scripts and pitching them ideas. And I went in and pitched ideas and it, it, it worked out to the point that, um, they didn't buy anything that I sent them, but well, they almost bought one script. I sent them, I take that back. They, they did another project, but then they came back to me six months later and said, Hey, we'd like you to write something for us. Okay, so okay, networking perfect. basically. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, Let's dig into the um, the dark place. Maybe to start out, you guys can give us give us a um, quick pitch or logline for the film, just so people kind of have some understanding of what it's about. Uh, it's about a young man who um, is estranged from his family. Um, he returns home to the uh, vast wine estate that his family runs. He finds that his uh, mother, who he hasn't talked to in years, has remarried. Um, he's got a stepfather and a stepbrother. They're up to no good, and they're about to uh, they're about to frame him and uh, steal the family fortune and, and kill his mom at the same time. And he's got to kind of rise to the occasion and uh, and save the day. Okay, perfect, perfect. And where did this idea come from? What's sort of the germ of this idea? Uh, whatever goes on in the back of my twisted mind. I mean, I, it was uh, it was the first movie that I pitched in Hollywood, um, and uh, it was just an idea that I came up with of what happens if you go home and you find that you've got a brand new family and the brand new part of the family is up to no good, and then it kind of spiraled out from there. Mm-hmm. Tell me, did... did um, I always just like to kind of get a sense of sort of where the writer's coming from in terms of their process. Was this something you came up with, like the characters and then the story? It sounds like the way you're describing it, you came up with the story first and then filled it in with the characters, or was it first coming up with the characters and then kind of coming up with the story? It was a little bit of both. I mean, it was what um, the the hero of the story is kind of, uh, you say young Sherlock Holmes, not really, but but it's kind of Sherlock Holmes asks, like, what would Sherlock Holmes have been like if he was 19, 20, 23? And what kind of family environment would produce that? And then how do you fictionalize that more? And all of these pieces just start clicking together. And the character is a little dark. And then the family life is a little dark. But he's so far in the hole, then he's got to – how do you put him so far in the hole that he's got to rise rise out of it to save the day? And how do you estrange him then from his family? And how do you do all of these kind of things? And so it just kind of organically grew like that. Okay. Okay. Take us quickly your writing process. You know, once you had this germ of an idea, how long do you spend outlining versus actually writing a script? How much? How many pages a day? How much do you write in a given day? All that just your sort of basic process. Um, I've learned from uh, uh, one of my best teachers I ever had was a, a gentleman by the name of Paul Chitlick. Um, he he's got a book out called Rewrite, and um, but Chitlick uh, actually. Uh, at the time, I, I was kind of unstructured in things, but he actually took us through, took me through um, doing the uh, the, se- the seven point spine and uh, working out the characters, and then doing an outline, and then doing a treatment, and then actually going on into writing the screenplay. So it's usually um, a month or two or three to to go from the from the spine to uh, the outline, 
um, then do the treatment, and then it's and then it's like a month or two to write the script, and so maybe four or five months from beginning to the process, and then um, and then it's however long you, it takes to revise the script and to new drafts and, and do different things. Mm -hmm. um, some days, you know, I, I'll write the entire day. Some days I'll get caught on things and I'll write just a little bit. Don't tell Steve, but I'll just write just a little bit and then pound my head against the wall the rest of the day. Um, and then um, it's it's some way in between there. And then if there's a deadline, yeah, I kind of write write more. But it's um, it's just it's just the how I feel how I feel about it and what I'm trying to do and how I'm trying to solve a problem in a story. Okay, okay. And talk about your development process a little bit. Um, once you've got a first draft, how do you get notes on it? Who do you send it to? Um, maybe Steve is he a part of this process as well? Um, Steve was a part of this process. Steve has been a part of the process with some with some of the later scripts that that um, he and I have done together. So Steve can chime in on that. But but generally speaking, not so much for the dark place. Um, it was done with other with other friends. But some of the stuff that I've written since, um, after I have a first draft, well, after I have the treatment, I've given it to to Steve. And he's gone, oh, I, I understand this. I love this. This I don't understand. Maybe you can do something with this. Here's an idea. Here's something you can work out. Um, and I take those notes back. And if I get like two, if it's a great note, I'll steal it and say that it was always my idea. And if I get like two or three or four people that that comment on something bad, then I realize I really have made a mistake and, and want to go in and change it. And then I'll write the, the, the actual draft of the script. And that goes back to people like Steve and other friends to read, and I get more notes, and you just kind of keep going from there. Is, does that sound like what you, what you experienced, Steve? Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much um, how it, it, it worked. Um, I think, Jody, it's, it's also worth mentioning um, just how uh, long uh, The Dark Place had been a script. <laughs> it was 10 years to get, to get The Dark Place from um, the first time that I pitched it um, I think it was uh, to the time that uh, Steve uh, decided to Steve found it and just and liked it and decided to uh, to set up the funding to make it. So it was it was about ten years. Okay, okay. So Steve, I'm curious. Um, it sounds like so you were integral in actually getting the funding. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what interested you about this project. What was it that sparked that interest that you said this is a project that I'm going to go out and and start trying to produce? Uh, well, I mean it. It was a combination of the humor and the mystery. Um, you know, it, the the element of making a mystery thriller that works um, is, uh, I, I think, really hard to do well. And I knew from the first read how delightfully uh, structured uh, the the whole script was, and I could see how. Uh, and indeed, the, the audiences have have proved it. I mean, they they do not get get it early um they they get it at at the reveal at the end when they're supposed to um and every step of the way um it is just it was just so tightly crafted um that you know you you it really had the audience and it really took you to where you needed to be every step of the way and i just found that awesome and i mm -hmm. frankly don't see that in scripts very often yeah, yeah. So and I, this is another question that I think both of you guys can kind of ch chime in on. Um, you know, Jody as the writer and then Steve as the executive producer. How do you guys kind of work your relationship where maybe there are some differences of opinion? I mean, I've been, definitely been in those situations where you have a director or a producer giving you notes that maybe you don't like as a writer. And, you know, the producer's like, well, you know, I've got to be able to believe in this. And, and were there ever those moments, Steve, where maybe you were giving Jody notes and he was wasn't that receptive or vice versa or Jody he was giving you notes that maybe you didn't think were that good and how do you come to a resolution on those types of issues Steve learned really early on that I was always right <laughs> <laughs> I need to get Steve's phone number because he's the executive producer I want to work with <laughs> um you know what one thing is that you know Jody and I have uh generally found that um as much as we disagree about something that what we do is we is we basically just come back around and spend more time talking and listening with each other um, to to hammer something out. Um, you know, we're 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 both big boys about this stuff. It's not you know uh, we we don't sit there and get all sensitive about uh, oh my my precious little baby you can't criticize it. Um, uh, you know you can criticize every everything and. 
Um, you know, I, I, I like to actually what one anecdote, which I think covers um, uh, the way we tended to work a little bit um, before we really knew each other. Uh, we were both involved on uh, a film and it was in post and it it had a horrible act four. Um, and uh, and we both independently um, uh, pushed for a couple of test screenings and feedback that enabled us to uh, with in, in concert with those filmmakers um, to get a good cut of the film. And uh, in fact, we, we discovered that while we were editing The Dark Place, um, that neither of us had known uh, entirely about what the other had been up to. Um, and likewise, when we approach these scripts, I mean, when there's a note, um, you know, it, it, it means something. It doesn't always mean what the note says, but it means something. And we're always willing to take the time to hash out, uh, you know, where did that note come from? And, and there really is something to some people give you a note and and it's a personal preference of theirs and you have to really listen to it and decide is that is that better than what I've done or, or um, is it worth stealing is it worth doing whatever um, and then other times people really can identify um, something that's not quite working in your script and I, my my kind of rule is if two three four five people all roughly say the same thing about the same spot in a script or multiple spots in a script. It's a it's a good note. It, it's saying that that either um, the, the usual case is you just haven't gotten something right in in your writing, or to the lesser extent is you have you have really gone out on a limb on a point, and you better be damn sure that um, as the saying goes, that's the hill you want to die on because you're going to get a lot of pushback from people. And you have to be 100 percent convinced that that what that what you're seeing is something that is new and novel and uh, and worth going to the mat for. Ninety percent of the time, in my experience, it's not that it's just that you've you've not quite gotten something um, that's that's right for people. Uh, you're going to you're going to confuse your audience too much and you want to go back and take a look at it again. Yeah, yeah. So it's advice for sure. OK, so now let's talk about what happened once you had a draft of the script that you guys both thought was was really, really good. What were those steps um, in actually going out and raising money? How do you go about raising money for a film like this? It was a combination, um, uh, Steve, uh, yeah. as I recall, of, of private equity funding and Kickstarter and Kickstarter money, right? Uh, right. And, um, you know, I, I basically I, I put up a bunch of capital and then basically spent a bunch of time going around to uh, all of my friends with money and pitching it, saying, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm in. You should join me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and talk about and, the let's go ahead. And, no. And, 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 and that worked. I mean, when the when the producer says we have I'm putting money into this. Um, I, we have Kickstarter money that's, that's gone into this. We, uh, will you put a money, money too? That really does help. Yeah. 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 And maybe you can talk about your Kickstarter campaign for just a second. Um, and maybe give us a couple of tips there. How did you get people to contribute to it? What was your, um, funding goal and, and how you know, how much money did you raise? Um, that was, uh, my, the other producers on the, on the project were really kind of, um, strong experts in, uh, in Kickstarter and uh, they had kind of worked it out to a science. I mean, it's kind of a every day, every day hitting it, every day um, having content, every day pushing and making people aware of what you're of what you're doing, and um, and going back to your to your base, and then trying to get your base to reach out to other people and, and bring it in. Um, we One had, of the uh, if so I can jump in there. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, uh, we did on that campaign was uh, recorded uh, a new video to go up to the Kickstarter site uh, for kind of every couple of days um, so that, you know, there there really was, uh, you know, some engaging media um, hitting people uh, along with all of the usual, you know, tweets and posts and so on. Uh, that um, uh, it's, and, and actually it wound up as a DVD extra. So uh, if you, if you want to see how that campaign looked, um, pick up the DVD and, and check that out. 
I think it worked yeah. out to about 20 minutes of total content um, in two or three minute chunks. And so and I think the campaign was a 30 day campaign. And um, and we basically every other day, every every three days we were putting up a new video, but tweeting and talking about things in the meantime. Plus, we did the usual. Uh, these are like little funny sk skits. On top of that, we were just doing interviews and, 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 and stuff. So it's a it's a full time process. Um, Steve and I have gone back and forth about is it <laughs> is it really worth it? I mean, at, at certain levels, um, it, it, it depends upon the, the amount of money that you raise. Um, and if you have no resources at all, it's probably worth it to go out and try to raise twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars towards your movie. At some point in time, once you get once you get into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, millions of dollars, I it, it, it starts to become more time intensive and uh, and cost you a lot on the back end to fulfill the Kickstarter rewards and things. Uh, and so I'm not exactly sure that it's always worth your time and worth the energy to do Kickstarter or Indiegogo or that kind of thing. Um, sometimes it might actually be better to to just shake hands and try to find um, the capital that you need to make make movies. I mean, Kickstarter is, is great for under two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar movies, but if you're trying to go into five hundred to a, a million dollar movie, Kickstarter is very difficult um, to raise that kind of capital. And you're really talking um, a whole different game. You're really talking a game where you've got to press the flesh, meet people, and try to find find folks with um, with enough capital that that uh, they're willing to give you big chunks. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, Steve, maybe you can just talk a little bit about your pitch of this movie and what that was like. I mean, you're going, you said you went to your friends that had some potential money to invest. Um, what did your pitch look like? Is it your pitch that, hey, this thing is going to make, you know, lots of money for us? Hey, this is going to be a cool project. Maybe you could just talk about what your pitch to your friends and um, colleagues is. Well, it, it was kind of interesting. Um, you know, I uh, was originally focused strictly on the financial payback. Um, but I ended up discovering that one of the best selling points and which, which brought on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the larger, uh, executive producers, um, was, uh, that they wanted to leave a legacy in film. Um, that as a result, this, that, that they read the script, that's actually key. You, you, you need them to read the script, I think, and you need them, to understand the movie that you want to make, uh, and um, and that is uh, you know a legacy that that outlives you. Um, yeah, I, I think that we we found especially where we were playing in the ballpark that we we're playing in, everybody wants to make their money back, but there's also something for people of a certain of a certain means who are able to give uh, you know a couple of thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand dollars towards a movie. A lot of it is they're getting something that you can't really get anywhere else. Is is anybody can go out and buy a car, anybody can go out and buy a house, but most people don't have the opportunity to go out and be a part of a film and get their name attached to a film and be a producer and go to film festivals and to say, here's something that I made. And for a lot of people, uh, that's a big that's a big deal. And there are a lot of people with a lot of money that will will part with fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars just to say I've got my name on a movie and it's it's something that the guy up the street doesn't have, the woman up the street doesn't have. And I feel good that I have um, uh, helped artists make stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's It was a really interesting thing to find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about – so now you've got your film. You've raised your money. You've got your script. You've raised your money. You've produced your film. What was your, um, your marketing strategy? Did you guys go to the festivals with this? Um, did you find a distributor – um, straight away, we uh, we were being tracked by a sales agent and by a sales agency, and uh, they got involved with us really early on, right, Steve? Yes. Um, in particular, uh, from my from my previous experiences, uh, I was very happy to get someone who was going to be a worldwide sales agent because I had seen in other independent films how badly you can get screwed by little details in the contracts and that's hard to collect from people. Uh, and that too is a lot of work and that's not what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. Um, it, so, uh, uh, we had, uh, uh, shoreline entertainment approach us. Um, they were very interested in the film. They, they, 
um, you know, saw the, the potential in it and uh, they took it over from there, essentially, with with the exception that uh, we ended up driving the festival strategy far more than they did. Uh, they they were good about um, being at market festivals like Sundance um, and 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 pitching things, but they weren't good at getting out to, uh, you know, all of the, the I don't know, I'll call it bread and butter festivals uh, that give you exposure. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's a really interesting debate um, still that that um, Steve and I have uh, the previous film that he and I both produced on um, most of this. Uh, a lot of the sales or a chunk of the sales and a chunk of um, uh, the work was all done in house is that the producers basically divvied up the task and, and, and found places to, to sell the film and got it onto iTunes and things and 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 made one revenue number and made one monetary number. And then now, and then going this time with a sales agency and the kind of revenue that they did, given the tools that are out there now, um, you have to kind of have an idea of, uh, can you do it yourself and, um, and do, and do well, or are you going to, will it be better if you turn it over to a sales agency and have them handle it? Or if you turn it over to a sales agency, will they, you know, do their best, but you wind up having all of your profits eaten up by fees on their side. And it's a it's a long conversation that you have to have, and you have to really um, think about it uh, um, dispassionately. And you really have to think about it: uh, what is going to be the best for the film, and what's going to be the what what kind of revenue numbers do you think you're going to get, and how's the best that you're going to maximize that for yourself and for your investors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so where are you now falling after going through this process on each, you know, sides of the coin? Kind of where are you leaning? Does it depend per project? Like certain projects you would say are better for self-distribution. Certain projects are better for having a sales agent. Yes, I, I think that the more commercial, um, the more celebrities, the more commercial uh, your project is, you are probably better off with a sales agent um, and uh, and pushing and driving things. If you have a niche movie that um, winds up at an A-level film festival, um, a Sundance, an Outfest, uh, something along those lines, depending upon whatever, then you're also good with a, with a sales agent. If you have, you know, a lot of people make B-movies, you know, a lot of people make, uh, you know, great B sci-fi and horror films. A lot of people make um, just the drama film they've always wanted to see or, or make. There is, with no names and no celebrities and, and just genre-driven, there's less money in, in, in those, if you're the, our first two films that we produced on were LGBT films and that market is a very small market. And so by the time you bring in other people to sell stuff, um, that pie, a small pie gets cut up really quick and, and the pieces are just are not that big. Horror films, the market is kind of saturated with horror films, especially low end horror films without without celebrities. So once again, um, you have to have something really novel that's going to that's going to drive it. Otherwise, you're probably best um, going um, into in a digital distribution on your own. If you get if you get a star in your film and it's a decent star and you went, wind up with a great film, then it's probably worth it to try to, to find yourself a sales agent. The other thing too is um, it's also good to involve a sales agent even before you get started. Well, this is something that Steve and I are, are doing now with a new project is trying to bring in a sales agent now with at the script stage help us find the cast or tell us what kind of cast we need to find to get the kind of budget, to get the kind of sales numbers that we need, that it's actually going to justify the sales agent. That's actually going to justify um, uh, the long-term financial prospects that we'd like. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're juggling all of these things. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, and just, again, I, this is a conversation for another day cause we could go on for hours on, on distribution, film distribution, but I'm curious, what do you see if you're going to do the self distribution? What are your avenues? I mean, it's just iTunes and Amazon. I mean, the, the digital distribution, are there other avenues to like actually make I'm, a sale? I'm a really big fan of, uh, of, uh, quiver digital. Um, it's a aggregator site and, um, it's, you go on there and it's nine fifty, and they'll, uh, they will put your film up, on uh, Amazon and uh, and Vimeo, and uh, they'll pitch. They can pitch you to Netflix. They can pitch you to Xbox. They can pitch you to a lot of different areas. I mean, it's they, it, it's they do a lot of stuff. And you can go to these one-stop shops now. Uh, they don't. There's no revenue cut. They they basically you pay them for do the encoding and, and to do the management of the of the file, and then you get whatever your film makes. Um, and uh, now, also. 
Go ahead, uh, also, if you watch the market, you see that people are consuming less and less physical media. So uh, that that really is the direction things are going in. Um, you you might as well embrace it uh, if you're uh, if you're a budget filmmaker and, or you're 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 trying to get something off the ground. Um, the physical media that has a ton more costs and that makes it harder for you to get back the money that you're going to put into the film. Yeah. 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 Even if you're, even if you're doing, you know, the $50,000 movie, um, or the $25,000 movie or, or whatever you're doing, there is still, um, $150,000 worth of effort that goes into a film. And it's kind of like the bare minimum and, and people have got it. You've got to trade horses to make up for whatever cash you don't immediately spend. But you also have to be very much aware of what this film is worth. And and are you do you really need a, a grade A sales agent or if you just put it on the digital services yourself and hire a PR company? And there are some great PR companies that are out there that don't cost um, an arm and a leg and do great jobs with arranging interviews and uh, uh, Twittering and, and, and that kind of thing for you. Can you make up, can you get the kind of audience that you need to make back the hard cash costs plus a little bit of profit so that you can go on and do the next film? Um, that's, that's the, that's the joy now. It's, it's, it's complicated, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. I guess um, the big thing that I'm hearing from filmmakers is, you know, all these digital platforms. I mean, you're not talking like iTunes and stuff for a, for the kind of low budget movie without a lot of stars in it. You're not talking about being able to generate much revenue, like ten, twenty thousand dollars over the life of the film. Like I have some filmmaker friends that have done that, and that's kind of the numbers they're telling me. And it does. It seems like the big money is still, you know, making that sale to Showtime for a month or a run in HBO. And I don't think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Can and you get those sales without a sales agent. I don't know that you can. So are you only talking about these digital? Um, the, some of the digital platforms are, are setting themselves up as sales agents now to pitch to Netflix and, and things like that. But even Netflix doesn't pay what it used to pay. Um, Netflix is, is rolling their money into their own original content. Um, Showtime and HBO and those kind of sales, again, um, if you go and take a look at that, 95% of the things um, on on HBO, Showtime, even you know the, the, their, their platform tiered, um, Showtime four or five, it still has a name in there, and um, it has some kind of celebrity in there to help to help sell it. It is very very difficult for a no name no name director, no name writer, no name cast genre film to really break out unless you are just super awesome, strange, different interesting it is just very hard there's so much content out there and manage your expectations accordingly yeah. yeah 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 so i always like to wrap up then that's that's great i appreciate that i'm actually i'm just at the beginning stages of embarking on a micro budget film so all that stuff is is great information for me and i know a lot of the people that listen to this are also trying that so how can people see the dark place do you have a release schedule is already out on video on demand it's already out it's on uh it's on itunes um it's on uh, uh amazon it's on vimeo um if you go to the uh darkplacemovie.com uh, which is the website uh, that has links to um, all the various places that it's playing at. Okay, perfect. I will get that in the show notes. And I always like to end this interview. Um, if you guys just want to give us your Twitter handle or Facebook page or blog, anything you feel comfortable sharing, just in case people want to follow along with what you're doing and, and kind of just get to know you more. Steve, what's the name of our glorious company? Uh, Cthulhu Crush Productions. Yes. Uh, and uh, on uh, Twitter and on Facebook. Okay, perfect. I will I will track all that down and I, as I said I'll put that in the show notes and I'll put it in um, so people can just click click right over. Um, Jody and Steve, this has been a great interview. Lots of great information. I really appreciate you coming on. Great, thank you. Really Happy thank to you. do so. All right. Thank you and good luck with the project. And um, next time you have a project, let me know and I'll have you back on and we can talk about that. We'll do. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you much. We'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. Bye. I just want to mention two things I'm doing at Selling Your Screenplay to help screenwriters find producers who are looking for material. First, I've created a monthly newsletter that will be sent directly to producers. Every member of SYS Select can submit one logline per newsletter. 
I went and I emailed my large database of producers and asked them if they would like to receive this monthly newsletter of pitches. So far, I have well over 250 producers who have signed up to receive it. These producers are hungry for material and happy to read scripts from new writers. So if you want to participate in this pitch newsletter and get your script into the hands of lots of producers, sign up at sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. And secondly, I've partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads sites so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, we've been getting probably 10 to 12 high quality paid screenwriting leads per week. These are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or are looking to hire a screenwriter for a specific project. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. These leads run the gamut fit from production companies looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas. There are shorts, features, there are producers looking for TV and web series pilots. It's a huge array of different types of projects that these producers are looking for. And these leads are exclusive to our partner and to SYS Select members. Again, to sign up, go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. I recently did a um, success stories page so that people could kind of check out what some other people who have used our services are saying about our services. So if you have any questions about that or are just wondering what kind of success people have had through the SYS Select services, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. So in the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Shant Hamasian, who recently did a horror short that's getting some attention. He got into some lots of festivals and got um, some real good press on that and is starting to get some meetings around town, um, potentially to um, shoot his short as a feature film. And we really walked through that whole process, how he made the film and how he got um, all this attention on it. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Jody and Steve. I've asked numerous writers who have come on the show, in case you haven't noticed, about how they handle notes that they don't like. And I think it's interesting to see kind of the pattern of responses that we're getting. And the reason I ask this question to a lot of the writers who come on is, um, is just because it's something that I've had to face and you will have to face as a screenwriter. And, you know, the, the, the question is basically, you know, how do you handle notes that you don't think are, are very good and, um, really go back and listen to what um, Jody said. And, and there's been, as I said, numerous other writers on the show that I've asked essentially the same question to, and really frankly, gotten essentially the same answer to. And I think you'll, you'll notice that none of these writers, I mean, these are the people who are coming on the show, you know, by definition are working writers. They're writers that are actually, you know, writing stuff, professional stuff and having movies made. And I think what you'll notice is that, um, you know, nobody has come on and just said, you know, as an artist, just stand your ground. Around. You know, most people are, are idiots and don't know what they're talking about. The the consensus is kind of, you know, you've got to take every note, um, you know, and, and try and implement it or try and at least listen to it and try and at least understand where that note is coming from. And, um, you know, you've got to be flexible and you've got to be able to work well with others. That's really the name of the game for, for screenwriting. Um, and I really think it's worth noting. And again, when I started out, um, you know, you, you don't really understand how this is going to play out until you've started to option stuff, so, some scripts and, and actually um, talk with some some directors and producers and even actors who, um, you know, potentially want to change your material. And you won't always think it's um, it's a great idea. In fact, you'll think a lot of these ideas are, are, are just downright bad. And um, but you'll still have to, you know, smile and nod your head and um, somehow make the best of it. I mean, that's just the life of a screenwriter. And there's really no um, there's no getting around it um, unless, of course, you want to raise the money for your film and, and direct it and produce it yourself, um, you know, which is kind of what I'm doing with the pinch. Um, in fact, not kind of. That's exactly what I'm doing with the pinch. So ultimately, it will be my my movie. But, you know, I am getting notes from people, even on something like that, where I am, you know, the sole creator of this movie, um, or I should say I have sole, um, you know, ultimately all the decisions are mine because I'm the one who's gone out and raised money. I'm the one who's written the script and I'm the one who's kind of putting the thing together. So ultimately, 
ultimately the decisions will be mine. But even in a situation like that, um, you know, I'm working with my DP and, and he has some notes that he wants to, to give me. And, you know, other people have sent me notes through the Kickstarter campaign. A lot of people read the script and sent me notes and, you know, you've got to, um, just exactly what Jody said, you know, if you're getting a lot of the same notes, um, from people, you've got to address those and you've got to think maybe, um, you know, the, the, if you get a bunch of notes from, you know, six or eight or 10 different people and you're getting a lot of the same notes, you got to figure that people watching the movie might have a similar note. Um, now, if you've given it to six or eight people and only one person is giving you that note, then, you know, maybe you just accept the fact that, you know, 15 or 20 percent of, of the population is not going to ne necessarily like your movie. But um if you're working as a paid screenwriter and someone, a producer is hiring you, you're going to be absolutely inundated in this and you really have to do it or they're just going to get rid of you. You're not going to have any kind of a screenwriting career unless you're flexible and willing to work well with others. Um, but as I said, even when you're doing something on your own, um, I'm looking at these notes and thinking some of them, some of these notes actually do make sense. And um, so I've got to go through. And as I said, I'm going to be taking another pass at my film. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.